we ask you in Jesus' name to speak to us by your Spirit. We're listening. We're listening to you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you that we are privileged to hear from you. We thank you once again. In Jesus' name, amen. As I was seeking the Lord, what I need to talk to you, the Lord has put a very, I would say, a unique topic on my mind to share with you this day. And if I had the freedom to be very honest with you, I would have chosen to speak something else. But this evening, what the Lord wanted me to speak to you is about the spirit of Amalek. And I know it sounds very strange to many of you. It sounded strange to me as well at the beginning when the Lord wanted me to speak on this, the spirit of Amalek. What is it all about? So this evening, let's turn our Bibles together to the book of Exodus chapter number 17. Exodus chapter number 17. And our focus will be on verses 8 to 15. We're trying to understand what God is trying to tell us today. We know the Bible says that everything that happened to the chosen people of God in the Old Covenant is an example for us. It is recorded as an instruction for us. That's what you read in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10 and verse number 11. The Old Testament chosen people of God had to fight physical battles. The chosen people of God in the New Testament period do not fight with physical enemies. The Bible says that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Our enemies are not human beings. But the Old Covenant tells us that the chosen people of God, the Israelites, they had to fight physical battles as they were coming into the Promised Land and as they were taking position in the Promised Land. And I believe it is so as we, the chosen people of God in the New Covenant period of time, as we journey through the walk or in the life of faith, there are many enemies that we encounter and we have to fight many spiritual battles. What we need to understand at the beginning is every spiritual enemy is different. Every battle that the Israelites had to fight was very different. Not only the enemy is different, but I want to tell you, when you engage in spiritual battles, you need to understand that every spiritual battle that you are engaged in has to be fought with a different strategy which is given by God. Many times we fail because we think just like Joshua and his uh, army thought that they could defeat certain enemies without seeking the guidance of God and then they had great defeat uh, in Joshua chapter 7. But we need to be sensitive to the leading of the Spirit. We need to be tuned, fine-tuned to the leading of the Holy Spirit and understand what is the enemy 
What kind of an enemy do I battle with? And what is the battle strategy that God has for us? You may be wondering, what is the spirit of Amalek? What is the spirit of Amalek? Let me tell you very briefly, and I'll give you the Bible reference later on to this. The spirit of Amalek is basically the spirit that has no fear of God. In other words, a spirit that has no reverence for God and the things of God. That's the spirit of Amalek. I will prove that to you from the, from the word of God. But for now, just remember that when we talk about the spirit of Amalek, it's basically talking about a spirit which has no reverence for God or the things of God. As we look into uh, uh, Exodus chapter number 17, what we understand is... The children of Israel has been brought out of Egypt after 430 years of bondage in slavery and they have crossed the Red Sea and they have come out victoriously through that experience and as they come from the Red Sea experience, the first enemy that they encounter is the Amalek, the Amalekites. And when they faced the Amalekites, what you need to understand is Israelites did not want to have a battle with them. Israel was not looking for a war with them. They were just moving forward into the promised land that God has ordained for them to take position. And they had just passed the Red Sea experience and they had come and experienced a supernatural provision of God supplying them water from a rock. So they were just after another supernatural provision of God. That's the background. So as they begin to journey, the Bible says that at a particular place that the Amalekites began to attack the people of God. Now where did the Amalekites exactly attack the people of God? The Bible says, if you follow me, I'm not going to read all the verses, but the Bible says, the Amalekites, verse number 8, came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. You see, when, when the Bible gives you certain locations and names and very specific details, you need to follow it. You need to understand why God is so specific about certain details in Scripture. The word Rephidim has a very, very good meaning over here. That tells you where the spirit of Amalek will attack you. The word Rephidim means a place of rest. Are you following me this evening? It's at a place of rest. Once there was an interview that they were taking with uh, Dr. Billy Graham. And they asked him a question. The question was, what is your advice to someone who has just had a great successful spiritual victory? or finished a great spiritual assignment, what would be your advice to such a person? He said, my advice is simple and straightforward. My advice is this, do not take a break. Very simple. In other words, do not rest after you have had a, a spiritual victory, after you, after you have had a great encounter with God, do not take rest. Because you need to understand at that particular time of rest is where the spirit of Amalekite comes and attacks you. And many times we think that, you know, after a, a great uh, victory or a spiritual uh, assignment that we have been so victorious uh, 
Sometimes we think that none can get close to us, but you need to understand that is the period of time that we become so open to the attacks of the enemy. And there are different enemies who wait for us to attack us in a place that we never expect them. So it is a place of rest that is Rephidim. So now Israelites are over there and suddenly the Bible says when they never expected the Amalekites to become their enemies, the Amalekites began to declare war against them. But if you really understand, they were not fighting the army of Israel. They were not fighting the strong men of Israel. Now that is the strategy of the spirit of Amalekite. This enemy does not fight against the strengths of you. How do I know that? How can I be so specific about it? Let's go back to the book of Deuteronomy where God through Moses is recalling the incident of Exodus chapter 17 and before Moses would depart uh, he's giving them uh, exhortation and calling back into remembrance the incident that we have just read in Exodus chapter 17 and in Deuteronomy chapter 25 we have a detail we have a greater insight uh, of how the how the Amalekites attack the people of God as they were progressing to the promised land. And I'm here to tell you as you begin to walk in faith and as you go and take new territory and as you move forward in Christ, you need to understand that you are going to face enemies down the line. And here is what's happening. And if you follow me in verse 18... I'm reading to you from the New International Version, but it says where this or who does the spirit of Amalekite attack? The Bible says those who were weary. Those who were weary was attacked by the Amalekites. I told you, they did not fight the strong men. They did not fight the army of God. But they went after, the Bible says, those who were weak or weary. In the other words, the meaning here, weary means those who have been so tired through the journey. You see, there are many times that we get physically tired, mentally tired, and you need to understand when we are in a moment of such tiredness, uh, the spirit of Amalekite can attack you. So the Bible says the first group of people that was attacked were the people who were weary, who were tired. And the second group who was attacked was those who were worn out. In other words, those who were exhausted. Those who were worn out. Now this is why I brought to your attention what Dr. Billy Graham said. Do not take a rest because that could be the time that you are really spiritually exhausted. You have done all what you have done. You have had the victory. You have seen God come through and it is true even in the life of Elijah. After he had had that wonderful victory at Mount Carmel, slayed the false prophets, uh, brought down the fire, and he was so victorious, uh, and suddenly there comes a word from Jezebel. And the Bible says he got so discouraged that he ran for his life. A man who was so victorious, who was so bold and so fearless, uh, who could stood against 450 false, uh, you know, prophets uh, of Baal and could have taken their lives one by one and had such courage to bring fire from heaven, fell prey to one single statement of Queen Jezebel. So we need to understand 
when we are really, really exhausted, worn out, for whatever reason, X, Y, or Z, you can be worn out in life. You need to be aware that that could be the moment that the spirit of Amalekites could attack you. And then, in that particular verse it says, look at your Bible, it says in the NIV, those who were lagging behind. Those who were lagging behind. In other words, what it means here is, those who were feeble, those who were weak, and those who could not stand their ground. Those are the ones that the spirit the Amalekites went after. They were lagging behind because they were feeble, they were weak. And we need to understand there are many brothers and sisters in the body of Christ who falls into this category. And if you say, I am not weak, I am not feeble, I am not exhausted, I am not tired, I am not weary. Praise God, then you got an assignment on your hands. Be that Joshua that you are called to be then. If you are not that person who are feeble and tired and weary and exhausted, then be the Joshua to those people who are weak and tired and weary and exhausted. Fight for them. It is no good, you know, sitting and making, you know, various comments and trying to analyze the situations. Rather, just as Joshua did in Exodus 17, get down to the battlefield and fight for those who are weak. Amen. That's what is needed to be done in Christendom today. If you are strong, praise God. If you are not feeble, praise God. If you are not weak, praise God. Then your part is the part of Joshua. To be that man who will step into that battlefield and fight uh, the Amalekites so that the weak brethren will be protected. Amen. The Bible says, now look at this. They did all this because the Amalekites did not fear the Lord. That's what I told you. The spirit of Amalekite means the spirit that brings us to a place where we will not have reverence for the things of God or for God himself. And this is a problem that even the prophet Malachi was tackling in his days. Please turn with me to the book of Malachi, the last book of the Bible in the Old Testament, really. Malachi chapter 2. I want you to see something, what the Lord says over here. And he is addressing the spiritual leaders of the time. And he's saying, let's, let's look at verse, uh, chapter 1 for a moment and then go to chapter 2. In verse number 6, the Lord is saying, As a son honors his father, and a servant his master, if I am a father, where is the honor due to me? If I am the master, where is the respect due to me? Stop. Ask yourself the question. Do I really, really respect and honor God and the things of God? If not, that's a clear indication that we have been attacked by the spirit of Amalek. We don't have the respect, we don't have the honor 
for God are the things of God, to the house of God, the people of God. Stop for a moment and think what I'm about to tell you. We all are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? God has given each one of us an equal value in his sight. Every one of us, irrespective of who we are, what our qualifications, you know, it doesn't matter to God, but when it comes to salvation, the price that God has paid for every individual is the same. Do you value your brother or your sister, your husband or your wife or whoever it is in Christ in the same way that you would honor and value Jesus Christ? Stop and think. Do I honor everyone irrespective of who they are and what they are in, in the body of Christ, do I see that this individual is valued in the sight of God as much as Jesus Christ? Because the, the Bible says the life is in the blood and Christ gave his sinless blood for our salvation. And that is what we will be partaking of and recalling into remembrance this evening. And I want you to understand that do we truly respect the other person as much as I would respect Christ or honor Christ? That's the question. When I say I honor you, I honor because the price that God has paid for you. When I dishonor or do not respect somebody, I'm diminishing the value that God has paid for that individual. So we need to understand that we need to overcome this battle. We need to start to honor and respect one another and give them what they do. It doesn't matter what they are. You're not going to lose anything because you are in line with what God is saying. You are conquering the spirit of Amalek because you say, I don't want to be disrespectful. I want to honor what God has honored. Amen. I want to honor what God has honored. That is how you overcome the spirit of Amalek in the body of Christ. The Bible says in Malachi chapter number 2, now he's speaking to the priest. And I want to tell you it's serious when you don't honor God and the things of God. It's serious. The consequences are dangerous. Chapter 2 verse 1. And now this admonition is for you, O priest. He's talking to the spiritual leaders. He's talking to us. He's talking to me. He's talking to those who Christ made priests and kings to his God and his Father. Amen? And he's saying, if you do not listen, and if you do not set your heart to honor my name, listen very carefully, it's serious. God is saying, if you do not listen and take to your heart to honor my name, says the Lord Almighty, now listen to me, I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. It's serious. When we take God for granted, when we take him lightly, when we take the things of God lightly, you need to understand that you and I position ourselves for a curse. Even the blessing turns to a curse. Why? Because we have not set our heart to honor the name of our God. This is serious. The Bible says, yes, I have already cursed them because you have not set your heart to honor me. 
And I do not know to whom I'm speaking this evening. Some blessings have been cursed. Some blessings have been hindered. Because you have just walked away from honoring the name of God. Now you may say, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not blaspheming, I'm not cursing the name of God. But let me tell you, whatever God has honored, when I do not honor what God has honored, I'm dishonoring God. That's why the Bible says, honor your parents. And you may say, listen, you know, my parents are the most miserable folks on the planet Earth. Could be. I'm not debating with you on that matter. But God in his wisdom to bring a person like you into existence needed that man and woman and their DNA to create you into this world for your assignment to be fulfilled. And don't challenge the wisdom of God. Honor what God has honored. Not because they are perfect, but because they are the chosen of God. It's serious. This is the spirit of Amalek in the church that's attacking and preventing the real blessings that God wants his people to have. And the very blessing has been turned to a curse because of the spirit of Amalek and we do not understand that we have been attacked. And there needs someone to rise up like Moses and Joshua to do their part so that the, the ones who are weak and feeble and worn out can be protected. Amen? The Bible says, let's go back to Exodus chapter 17. And let's read verse 11. Exodus 17, 11 tells us now. And as long as Moses had his hands uh, held up, the Israelites were winning, but whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. What's going on here? I told you that every enemy is different and every strategy of battle is different. You see, the way that they had to overcome, the Amalekites were completely different. They could not do it in a different way because God had given them a strategy. And what is the strategy over here? Moses had to go up the mountain with the, with the rod of the Lord in his hand and lift it up. And as long as the rod has been lifted up by the hands of Moses, the Bible tells us what happened. The Israelites had victory. Amen. And when the hands of Moses was coming down, the Amalekites had victory. What is this telling you and me? We need to understand that you and I cannot have victory over our enemy with our physical strength. It doesn't matter how, how strong Joshua and his soldiers were. They just could not prevail the Amalekites the moment the hands of Moses were coming down. It all depended on one thing and one thing alone. And that was as long as Moses' hands were up, there was something happening. So what is this teaching us today? It's teaching us today something important that we need to get serious with God's instructions. Let me tell you, every defeat of life uh, can be traced to instruction that we have failed to obey from God. Go back in your life and look at every time that you have been a loser, that you have been defeated in your Christian walk or elsewhere, and you will understand you and I have failed to just observe uh, instruction that God has given us. Amen. So the Bible says in verse number 12, it says over here, and when Moses' hands grew tired. Did you see that? You see, the spirit of Amalek is always trying to make you weak. Moses' hands get so tired. And God tells us that in this battle, we need one another. Amen? 
Moses needed Aaron and Ur. You need people around you to be victorious in your Christian life and walk. Moses being who he is, a man who had great encounters with God, a man who, who saw the glory of God, has to know that all battles cannot be fought alone. I need a Joshua, I need an Aaron, I need an Ur. I need one another so that we can be victorious as a people of God. Amen? Don't you ever think that you can conquer every battle of life all alone? You need God, yes, no doubt about it, but you need one another. That's why God has brought you into a body called the church. That's why we are linked to one another. That's why we are interconnected to one another. There is nothing called independent. We are all interdependent. Are you following me? Don't you ever think I can be on my own and you know what, I can, I can be that great hero. That's not God's ways. That's not God's strategy. That not, that's not the biblical pattern of victory. We need to understand something here. God had given Moses the instruction. Get up on the mountain, Moses. Lift up your hands with the rod in it. And then you will see when Joshua is on the field battling the Amalekites, you will have victory. And you read the story, you understand how Moses needed help to keep his hands up. Because when his hands were up, it gave victory to Joshua and his army. So that tells us uh, that, you know, we need people who are out there doing the battle and then we need another group of people who really know how to intercede in line with God's instructions. Amen? We really need, we, we, we are a team. It's time that we need to team up and understand that we need to work together so that we will see the victory being manifested in the body of Christ. Amen. I want to tell you something very important. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 41. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples in the garden of Gethsemane. And he says to them, watch and pray. He did not say just pray, but he said watch, which means give strict attention and then pray. That's what the word watch means there in the Greek. In other words, he's saying give close attention, pay close attention. Give strict attention and then you pray. Why? That you may do not enter into Temptation. The word temptation there means evil experience. That you will not enter into an evil experience. Watch, pay close attention as you pray so that you will not experience, uh, you know, evil in your life. You will not have an evil experience because it says your spirit is willing, but hear me now, but the flesh is weak. The word weak there in the Greek means feeble, impotent, no strength. You see, God is speaking to us this day. And we need to understand our physical obedience bring spiritual victories. Let me repeat myself again. Physical obedience brings spiritual victory. 
what you do with your body affects your spirituality. That's what happened in Exodus 17 that we have been looking in. When Moses was lifting his hands, Israelites were victorious. Because that was the simple instruction. Now you may ask me, does that make sense? It doesn't. That is why faith comes into play. You don't have a, a logical, cognitive explanation that can be satisfying to a reasoning mind to say, what does it have to do with lifting up hands and an army battling out there with the enemy and bringing them victory. You just follow the instructions of God. Amen. Obedience is what God is looking for. That's why we have a wonderful old song that says, Trust and obey. There is no other way to be happy in Jesus. Trust and obey. Period. Just trust and obey. When things does not sound reasonable to a reasoning mind, trust and obey. You will have your questions asked answered when you get up there but for now trust and obey if everything can be explained to the last letter of it then you don't need faith are you following me it does not make sense to me how Moses's hands being lifted up gives victory to Joshua and his army it does not make sense to my reasoning mind. But I know one thing sure. When God says something, it happens. Just follow the instruction. When the Lord said, fill up the jars in Cana with water, the servants obeyed. Then he says, take from it and serve the master of ceremonies. And somewhere down, as they were walking with this water, it turns into wine. Strike the rock, water gushes forth. Stretch out your rod and divide the Red Sea, it happens. March around the wall of Jericho and then on the seventh day, on the seventh day go seven times and then you make a joyful sound, the walls come down. Don't ask me how it happened. It just happens. Cast your net on the other side. And you have a great catch of fish, which you never had toiling all night. How did that happen? I do not know. That's called faith. Amen? So what is God saying to us this day? We need to take God on his word. What you do with your body brings great victory in the spirit realm. Let me just give you this example from the book of Daniel and I'm going to close here. Please turn with me to Daniel chapter number 10. Read this chapter from verse 1 to verse 21. That's Daniel chapter 10. And then you see that something happens in Daniel chapter 10. In verse number 2 the Bible says that Daniel began to mourn for 21 days, the question arises, why on earth does he mourn over here? You see, crying and mourning is two different things. Crying has to do with emotions. Mourning has to do with reasoning. Amen? I hope you get it. You mourn because you understand and it's out of your own choice and it's out of your own will that you mourn. So Daniel is in a mourning period of 21 days. And the Bible says, 
the reason for his mourning. You know why? Always when you read your Bible, stop and ask many questions. I always encourage you to do that. When I read the Bible, I have so many questions. So many questions. And if you stop to ask why does this man mourn for 21 days, the answer is found in chapter number 9 and verse 27, I guess. Daniel 9, 27. Because he, he's been told by the messenger of God about an abomination that causes desolation in, in Jerusalem and in the temple of God. He has such a passion and such a burden for his people and the city of Jerusalem and the things of God. And when he gets to know there's going to be an abomination that causes a desolation in this great city that God has put his name upon and it is affecting the people of God. The Bible says this man goes into a period of mourning and prayer and fasting. And I wanted to show you something over here in verse number three. Look at verse number three there. This is Daniel chapter 10 and we are in verse three of chapter 10. And it says, look very carefully now. I ate no choice food or I did not eat any pleasant. What did he do? He did not eat anything that was pleasant. He, he says, I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled, 21 days. He was in a period of mourning and I want you to pay attention on the word pleasant. Pleasant. The Hebrew word there, pleasant, means kemdo. And it means to be desirable or precious. In other words, Daniel makes a choice that he would not eat any pleasant bread or he would not eat something which is desirable to him. He refrains, he makes a choice to refrain from such kind of uh, delicacies for a period of time. What am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you what you do in your body affects the spirit realm. It affects the, your spirituality. It affects your life. It affects how God begins to address you. Come with me to verse number 9. Verse number 11 really. Verse number 11. And you see the messenger of God carrying the message of God to this man in a vision. Look how God, the messenger of God addresses him. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man of greatly beloved. Could you please mark that in your Bible? The word greatly beloved. It's one word in the Hebrew. And it means, in the Hebrew again, the Hebrew word is kemdo. The same word that you saw in verse number 3. So what is God saying? When you make a choice to stay away from the things that gives your flesh pleasure you become desirable honorable loved or greatly beloved by God the Father amen you will get it sometime later if you didn't get it now you see what you do in your body what you do 
with your body affects how God sees you. You see, the love of God is you cannot buy God's love by doing stuff. God loves everybody across the board the same. But I'm talking about being desirable to God. Being precious in the sight of God is what you do with your body matters to him. So Daniel says, I refrained from pleasant food. Now it is not the food that makes you spiritual or not. What I'm trying to say is your sacrifice in wanting, you know, to please God and put your flesh to death. That is what pleases God. It's not what you eat. It's not the food that makes you spiritual. Somebody asked me once upon a time, if I follow the, 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 the food list in Leviticus, how will that affect me? I said, a very simple answer. It will make you healthy, but it will not make you spiritual. Your spirituality is not based on the food that you eat, but it's a choice that you make uh, not to, you know, satisfy the passion of your body, but you want to, you know, please God in everything that you do. That is what God counts you more desirable, honorable more than other people. So when Daniel began to do that, you see in verse 19 as well, the same word comes up again. Greatly beloved. Daniel is called the greatly beloved. God desires him. God looks at him as precious. Because of the sacrifice he's making. And the Bible says if you read that chapter you understand. The day, the first day that Daniel began to pray for understanding of the abomination that causes the desolation, the answer was coming and then the Bible says, the principality of Persia prevented him, prevented the messenger coming through to Daniel. And he, he was held there for almost 24 days. But Daniel continued praying, not knowing what is happening in the spirit realm. I want to tell you what you do in your physical body as an effect in the spirit realm. Amen. When Moses was praying, Joshua was winning. Amen. So it's time as we enter a new year to make a determination, to make a resolution if you are not made one and say, God, I want to be desirable for, by you. I want to be precious in your sight. And I'm ready to give up the things that brings satisfaction to my body, even for a period of time, Lord, and set my life aside to be with you. Amen. So, my desire is to see you this coming year, throughout this year rather, a man and a woman who would want to be precious in the sight of God. A man and a woman who will want to honor what God honors. So that you will position yourself to be blessed of God. You don't want to dishonor the things of God. And sometimes it may be difficult for you to agree with certain things. That's fine. But just do what God asks us to do. And our blessings will be more blessed. That's what you saw in Malachi. Honor the name of God. Honor the things of God. Have reverence. Don't take things for granted when it comes to God and the things of God. Take things seriously this year. Try to honor everybody as you honor Christ. See Christ in everyone. Give them that honor because they bought with this, the same precious price that he paid. 
Let's honor one another. Let's honor the things of God. And let's position ourselves to be walking in that blessing that God has for us. Let not our blessings be cursed of God. So let's understand how God wants to, us to do things. Let's be sensitive to the leading of the blessed Holy Spirit this year. And say, Lord, I just want to set my life aside so that my life will be more precious in your sight. Let's take a few moments to close our eyes and bow our heads in the presence of God this evening. It's time to make some decisions concerning your life. It's, time to, it's, it's a good time to make a resolution for this year, if you have not made one, that you want to please God about everything else. That you want to honor God about everything else. That you want to follow the instructions that God gives you to the last letter so that you will see some breakthroughs that you have never seen before in the past years. Ask God to forgive you if you have been disrespectful, if you have not honored what God has honored, including your parents, including your spiritual authorities that God has placed above you. You may see many faults and mistakes. But that is not a reason to be disrespectful to a person or a position that God has honored. You don't want to be cursed. You don't want your blessing to be cursed. But you want to be blessed. Look out and understand what God is asking you to do. Let's understand that we are battling with the spirit of Amalek, an enemy that does not have reverential fear for God or the things of God or the people of God. That's what God said about Amalek. They do not fear God. The Bible says to fear God is the beginning of all wisdom. The fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom. Be strong, be courageous to fight for those who are lagging behind. Fight to protect those who are weak in, the, in, spirit, in their spiritual life. Fight for those to be protected who are spiritually worn out. And the Amalekites are trying to destroy them by injecting the very nature of being disrespectful to the things of God. When you are spiritually worn out, when you're spiritually weak, it is quite easy for the Amalekites to come after you and destroy you by their very nature, which is being disrespectful to the things of God. Do you see certain areas in your life which you have become very disrespectful? The 
it's time to set things right and say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You and I are called to judge ourselves. Don't try to justify the mistake that you and I have done. But let's just come before God and say, Lord, you know what? I've not been respectful. I've not honored. I've not honored what you have honored. I'm sorry. I will not do it again. Give me the grace to move forward. That's all God wants to hear from you. That's all. Put your life in a place where God can bless and where your blessings will not be cursed. Honor everything that God has honored. Honor everyone as you would honor and respect Christ himself.